Welcome back to the Perfected Health Podcast. This is episode six, where we'll be discussing EMF radiation, 5G, cell phones, Wi-Fi, smart meters, microwaves, LED lights, and we will even touch on air quality in your home. I'm here with Matt Fiskin, who started working in IT in his early 20s and noticed a physical and cognitive decline when he was at work. He ended up piecing things together and now works as an EMF consultant. Matt, I can't thank you enough for how much you've helped me in the past, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Thanks a lot, Frank. It's really great to be here. And you know, I have to, I have to thank you for all the great information that you've put out there for the world. Um, you know, I first noticed your videos about a year ago, and at the time I was very skeptical about this whole carnivore phenomenon. Thought it was just a fad. Um, and in the past year, I've really um, not only learned a lot from you, but from trying a low carb, no carb approach to eating, experienced um, amazing benefits that I think can, can apply to EMF exposures and, um, and other insidious toxins in our, in our lives. Um, so I really am, am glad to be here. Yeah, it's really unfortunate how many negative things there are in our lives now that we've taken a step away from how humans used to naturally live just a mere hundred years ago. You know, it seems like we're trying to piece together a puzzle that takes up almost all of our free time. But very basically, what is EMF? So EMF stands for electromagnetic field or electromagnetic frequency. Um, and it is synonymous um, for all intents and purposes with electromagnetic radiation. So if you see EMF or EMR, uh, those two abbreviations can be considered the same. Now, EMF is something that occurs naturally in our world. Uh, the Earth has its own electromagnetic field. The sun is pumping out electromagnetic frequencies constantly. And there are even these frequencies and radiation bombarding us from outer space in various levels all the time. What we're talking about today is the man-made or non-native EMFs. These are things like radio frequencies or wireless radiation, uh, also known as microwave radiation. Um, dirty electricity is a more recently understood form of radiation uh, that is a lower frequency than, than radio frequencies. Um, but equally problematic. And going farther down the spectrum to the power line uh, frequencies are electric fields and magnetic fields that are common in homes near wiring, power lines, substations, transformers, that kind of thing. So a lot of the comparisons that are done between EMF, people are like, her dar, the sun has EMF. But, but there is there's a substantial difference between these two things. There is. The main one is that we have evolved for eons under a very relatively predictable amount of, of exposure to these natural frequencies. Um, getting X number of hours of sunlight every day, um, having a very consistent uh, low frequency field from the earth. And, and then occasionally, you know, there might be some, uh, some radiation that comes in from outer space that, you know, is it good or bad? We don't know, but we can't really do anything about that. Mm -hmm. um, what we can 
do something about are these um, these fields that we've created, and and I think you know it is <laughs> it's a good point that um, you know so many times in comments responding to one of my YouTube videos or an article, um, you know, someone is quick to point out that there's more radiation coming from the sun than from your Wi-Fi router. So, you know, should we just all stay inside and avoid the sun? Um, and, and so that sort of, uh, <laughs> that sort of logical fallacy really doesn't hold up when mm -hmm. you begin to look at the science and understand uh, what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So there are definite health concerns about EMF to a very extreme extent that people aren't really noticing or experiencing. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, let's start with how you discovered EMF. Yeah, so, um, you know, I like to think that, that my EMF uh, story or experience um, really really started from really early age when uh, for the first five years of my life my family lived off the grid we were um, we lived in New England in a very small town of about 300 people we had no electricity and we were about you know five or ten miles from the nearest store um, that experience, even though as a, you know, as a toddler growing up, I certainly took for granted. Um, looking back, um, and the more that I have made efforts to reduce my exposure to EMF, the more I realized that that experience provided a reference point um, that in today's world, very few people get to experience. Um, and I think that's been one of the the real clinchers for me in terms of um, understanding that these exposures, even though they are so widespread and common nowadays, they are not required. Uh, you can live a, a relatively normal life without ruining your health by uh, being exposed to these unnatural frequencies and, and radiations. Yeah, especially, you know, girls staring at their phones all day and not just girls, but just people in general glued to their phones all day, uh, you know, staring at the screen, walking down the street. I, I think people typically think of that, you know, teenage girl who's, who's always typically texting on her phone, but that's what every single person is doing now. Uh, doesn't matter their gender, doesn't matter their age. It seems like every single person is glued to their cell phone and it's about a foot away from their face. Uh, I personally discovered EMF uh, when you know I was playing a lot of video games in my teens, and I, I moved my modem next to my bed because I was you know directly hooking my computer up, and I started having insomnia, and I just couldn't fall asleep. But the router was literally several feet away from my head at the time, and I was like, "Why can't I sleep? Why can't I sleep?" And I literally Googled, "Can a router or modem cause insomnia?" And I, that's how I discovered EMF. And when I moved the router out of my room, I was sleeping fine again, and I was okay for several years. Uh, but then recently, I went out to California on a TV show in a hotel that was very high EMF. Uh, and I've been working in New York City. Uh, and in both of these environments, I was unable to sleep. And just going down to work, I would get headaches and stomach aches every single day at work. And then as soon as I got back home, it was like instant relief, no more, you know, stomach aches, no more headache, and I felt better. Uh, so you had a similar yeah. experience when you were working in IT, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I became very interested in technology and computers uh, in high school, and, and that turned into um, a pretty uh, enjoyable career uh, in IT, working in higher education. Um, now, unfortunately, <laughs> the institution that, that I was working for is a very progressive, um, you know, tech technology user. They were the first college campus in the country to have um, Wi-Fi throughout the campus. 
And this was back in um, 2000, 2001, when um, Wi-Fi was, was still in its infancy. Um, it certainly wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. Um, and so my, my work in technology, I think, often g gave me a sense of security. Uh, you know, I understand how these things work, how, um, and, and I think that that, um, like many people who work in a technical field, um, prevents us from really examining what is possibly going on um, to ourselves. And, and when I think the focus tends to be on the, uh, the computer or the software or uh, the network and, and sort of how they, they work in this, uh, in this sterile environment. So uh, after about five, six years of, of this work, I, I noticed that, um, like you, there was a dramatic difference between how I felt at work versus how I felt when I would be at home or maybe somewhere else, like going for a hike uh, or, you know, anything, anything else that was, that was not at work. And unfortunately, I was not able to figure this out while, while at this job. Um, I decided to quit. I knew something was not right. The, the people that I was working with seemed uh, stressed out as well. And that led to, you know, a number of, of uh, challenges at work that I decided it would be best if I simply removed myself from the situation. A few months later, um, as luck would have it, or, or maybe bad luck, depending on, on your perspective, um, a wireless internet facility, uh, also known as WiMAX, was installed um, about 500, 600 feet away from, from my house. And I'll, I'll never forget that day. I think it was just about nine years ago. It was October 7th of 2010. Um, and I was out raking leaves, um, doing some yard work. You know, it's bad if you remember the specific date. You know, it's bad. That was, that was the turning point. Um, but, uh, but I'll never forget because it was the catalyst for a lot of, of um, improvements in my life. And so, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse to have this sort of thing happen where um, all of a sudden you're raking leaves and your ears start ringing. Um, you suddenly become very distracted. Um, it felt a bit like, like being you know, invasion of the body snatchers, <laughs> um, where all of a sudden I did not feel like myself. And not only did I not feel like myself, I felt like I did when I was at work. And I hadn't felt that way in over three months. So uh, I went inside, tried to, you know, collect myself, figure out what, what could be going on. And a little while later, a, uh, a truck drives by my house. Um, and I looked at the logo on the side of the truck, figured out what that company was. And sure enough, uh, my neighbor had agreed to allow this company to put a number of antennas on his roof, um, essentially create a cell, a cell tower on his roof. Now today, this is, this is so common. I mean, especially in any urban setting, you're going to see uh, cellular antennas on roofs, on telephone poles, um, attached to the sides of houses to provide internet access. Um, but at the time, this, this, was, um, this was a mystery to me. As I began to sort of unpack this, uh, this mystery, it became pretty obvious to me that there was plenty of information uh, suggesting that the radio frequency microwave radiation that was now being broadcast at my house <laughs> from, from my neighbor's roof uh, 
is, is a health concern. And when I talked to the company about it, their simple answer was, well, if you are concerned, then you should talk to the FCC about it, the Federal Communications Commission. And long story short, um, that was the beginning of my interest in EMFs. Um, I began purchasing meters to measure these, these radiations and reading as many books and online articles as I could. Um, it led to a blog that I was writing for a couple years, maybe between 2011, 2013. It led to some activism in the state that I used to live in, um, in terms of smart utility meters. And ultimately it led to a new career, helping other people navigate and minimize their exposure to EMFs. Um, and, and I've tried to take that one step farther by posting videos on YouTube in order to share my experience, my understanding, um, and really just myself, to, to put myself out there like you have, to show people um, that reducing your exposure to EMFs may sound like a fringe extreme lifestyle on the surface, um, but in reality, there are plenty of perfectly normal people who really need to take these steps in order to feel like themselves. But this is difficult to understand because you were at that house and you put two and two together, but there were what, you know, at least dozens to hundreds of other people. And I think just about everyone now is living in a high EMF environment and they're just coping with it. So there's definitely, you know, some sensitivity versus sensory fatigue things that you brought up as well as, you know, some kind of individual genetic tolerance are body's subjective ability to, you know, for its antioxidant cycles, you know, for its, you know, how quickly we can recover. And I mean, someone like myself, I don't sleep that well. So that probably ties into why I'm so sensitive uh, to this stuff. Uh, is there an explanation? Are, are people just living in constant state of, you know, chronic, you know, suffering from the EMF wavelengths? I think that's a really good question. And I think that there are a couple of things going on here. Um, based on my experience and a lot of my clients' experiences, the sensitivities to EMF, whether you're talking about disrupted sleep, headaches, uh, ear ringing, skin rashes, difficulty concentrating. Lots of kids at schools were saying they were getting stomach aches, tummy aches when they went to school. Those sorts of acute symptoms related to EMF exposures, I think, tend to be more prevalent when your exposure is fluctuating um, and where you might have a home environment that is relatively low exposure and a work or school environment that's much higher, or even vice versa. Uh, you might live under a cell tower and work out in the woods away mm -hmm. from EMF and you would have uh, similarly a more noticeable change in your um, perception of how you feel. Um, I think it's, it's quite likely that when we are exposed in a more constant way, um, you know, I think the easiest way to expose yourself constantly is to have a smartphone always on and near your body. Um, or if you maybe work from home. Those Apple so watches are terrible, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch one with a 10 foot pole. Um, <laughs> I, I think that. The new ear pods too. The new ear pods, the Wi-Fi headphones. It's, it's crazy. Anything, anything Bluetooth is, emitting a radio frequency microwave signal in the 2.4 gigahertz range, which is the same as Wi-Fi, which is the same as your microwave oven, 
which is the same as many of the frequencies that we've known for decades cause non-thermal biological effects. Mm -hmm. And so when we are constantly exposed to any stressor, um, whether it is the stress of a job or the stress of a relationship, um, or, you know, I think, I think a really good analogy here is, is to think about people who are, who are in combat. Um, generally, the post-traumatic stress disorder that is, that is associated with, you know, that type of situation um, doesn't actually manifest until they return home to their home environment. And suddenly their body can begin to heal from that constant stress. Now, if your body begins to heal and then suddenly is put back into that stress, it becomes this vicious cycle where um, your body's constantly on edge and you, you really can't, uh, can't fully relax or heal. And so the sympathetic nervous system, um, the, you know, the fight or flight mechanism associated with adrenaline and cortisol, these, these kinds of hormones becomes dysregulated to a point where even what would be considered to be a low exposure can have, um, significant effects. And, and so that's, similar to maybe a combat veteran who, who just simply a loud noise can trigger that, uh, that, ner that central nervous system response. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so to your point, I, I think that sensory fatigue is what most people are experiencing regarding EMF. Um, and that's, you know, growing up in, in a rural area, you know, you kind of get used to the smell of cow manure and it doesn't really bother you that much. Um, but if you are a city slicker and you go on vacation and you drive by that farm, boy, you really smell it. Unless you, unless you've been to New Jersey before then nothing smells as bad as New Jersey. <laughs> so there is some very sensationalist stuff such as, you know, 5g, you know, being used as military, uh, you know, literally bees dropping dead when they put up 5G towers. And there's also those declassified military papers that are, are pretty popular in, in the context of the EMF. Uh, are, is there truth to some of these things? Yeah, so 5G is the fifth generation wireless network that's being created. Um, and, and that's something that I, you know, have been aware of for a number of years now. So I think that as it's now coming to fruition, I think there are serious concerns with the newer frequencies, the proximity of these um, sites, these cell sites to residential areas. Um, and, and I think that there, there's reason to be, um, there's very good reason to be concerned about these, these newer networks. Um, at the same time, I think that there are, there's a tendency to focus on things that are yet to arrive um, or maybe things that are outside of our control rather than look at the fact that 4G continues to be built out just a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, I was I stopped and was talking to some some workers who were putting in some new 4G antennas, and so I think that there is this there's a risk that focusing exclusively on 5G when maybe it's not even in your neighborhood could be a distraction from some of these exposures that uh, are already down the street mm -hmm. or in your home uh, that you have purchased and invited into your home. Mm -hmm. um, I so think it's, 
right now it's really bad. We're suffering from high EMF exposure and 5G might just make it a little bit worse. So we really need to focus on what's happening right now and what we're being exposed to on a daily basis. I think that's what I try to emphasize in my, in my videos and with my clients is that there is an enormous amount of, of stress that is caused by um, things that we have 100% control over and of course, there are things outside of our control, um, but if we're only focusing on them and not the things, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, um, then, then we're not really going to make any significant health improvements. And I think um, there's, there's also the possibility that, that this fear of things whether it is uh, a new technology or a um, power line or something that our neighbor's doing, mm -hmm. that, that fear can be itself a source of stress mm -hmm. that is going to affect your health. I think some people might be thinking right now, what is this actually doing to my body? Uh, you know, we, we saw those papers about birds and bees dropping dead. So, you know, why aren't humans dropping dead standing next to towers? And there have been quite a few studies that demonstrate certain things in the body from, you know, cortisol going up, testosterone lowering, uh, lowering like messed up calcium metabolism in cells. Uh, was there anything very concerning that can be used as like a general explanation for what's going on? Or is each source of, you know, EMF different in that way? So there are, there are plenty of studies and research showing generally with animals um, that specific frequencies can have very specific and predictable biological results. Um, I think uh, there are a couple that jump to mind. One is the effect on cardiac health in terms of heartbeat irregularity. Um, so this is you know, atrial fib fibrillation um, and, and other tachycardia episodes have been induced simply by holding a Wi-Fi router next to someone's chest in a blinded study where they do not know whether that router is on or not. But sure enough, within a few seconds of that microwave signal being turned on, their heart rate can double or, or even triple. Um, and this, this is something that, uh, that my dad was, was dealing with a few years ago. Um, and I think since then he's, he's been doing a lot better. I think part of that has had to do with getting Wi-Fi out of his house and, uh, and using his cell phone in a more limited way. Um, the other, the other kind of, research that I think is really compelling is the live blood analysis that looks at blood cells under a microscope following some type of exposure to EMF. And what often happens is blood cells are typically floating around um, and, and usually have a very round appearance. And when they are exposed, when we are exposed to certain fields, our blood can essentially coagulate, clump together, and it creates a, uh, a more of a bottle cap, um, kind of a rigid outer layer. And so clearly, based on, on these, um, I think, well-conducted studies, there are visible, or at least with a, you know, with a microscope or the right equipment, um, very clear, acute symptoms that, that can manifest through these exposures. Um, and then there are hundreds, if not thousands of other um, studies looking at this kind of thing in animals. Um, you know, more recently, there was a national toxicology program study looking at cancer in rats um, and, and and so 
there's, there's really a mountain of, of evidence going back decades. You know, this research began in the 40s and 50s. By the early 70s, um, there was plenty of, of, of information coming out, not necessarily coming out, but, um, you know, at that time, classified information that our government was, was producing, showing how EMFs and specifically wireless radiation affects our blood, cardiovascular, um, central nervous system, digestion, um, hormone regulation, you know, from our glands, and, uh, and certainly vision is another one, um, as well as reproduction. Those two things are probably the most critical because our reproductive organs, or at least our reproductive organs, um, as men, <laughs> And our eyes are the most sensitive to this type of radiation because there's very little protection um, from from these from these sources of, of radiation. So we see what's happening in studies. What are the typical symptoms that people are experiencing? You know, you did mention the feeling of stress. Uh, you know, raising cortisol. You know, you had the ringing in your ears. Uh, I've had headaches. I've had stomach aches. You know. The most noticeable thing to me is in that video where I went down to the, the animal rights march, uh, I was talking to one of the kids down there and he literally couldn't answer a four word question. He was in such a fog. But even when I was having a conversation with him, my thoughts literally disappeared out of my head when I was in that high EMF environment of New York City. Uh, what are the most noticeable things that people will actually experience if they're suffering from a high EMF environment? Yeah, well, that is um, the challenge in a lot of this in convincing people is that the types of symptoms that are generally caused by EMFs um, can be caused by other things as well. Um, and so, you know, there are, you can have a headache from being dehydrated Mm -hmm. um, and you can have a headache from, uh, you know, from talking on your phone too long. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to parse out exactly, for, you know, what is causing what symptom. Um, personally, my acute reaction to EMFs is, uh, is most noticeable within five or 10 minutes of, of being near a Wi-Fi router. Or, or a cellular um, cell tower, my ears start to really bother me um, and they will either uh, begin ringing or I'll have a pressure, sort of like I have um, water stuck in my ear, similar to the pressure change that can happen on an airplane. Mm -hmm. and, and after that, um, there is usually a, you know, as you mentioned, brain fog is, is so widespread nowadays, there's a hundred different possible culprits that can be causing it, um, anywhere from toxins to uh, refined carbohydrates to poor air quality. Um, but EMFs seem to have a very unique ability to affect our brains um, in what I consider to be, you know, digital ways. So as you mentioned, you're suddenly, um, suddenly the, your train of thought is just gone. Yeah, I was trying to say something and then I literally can't think of what I was going to say. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, we have, to, uh, we have to realize that that's part of being human. But at the same time, uh, when you begin to take steps to minimize your exposure, whether it's maybe taking a few days off from using your smartphone or unplugging your Wi-Fi router in your home for a few days, I even go to the level of turning off the power in my home. Essentially, I'll leave my fridge running um, at night 
And other than that, I have no power in my home. And that has, has been really noticeable. What is more noticeable is the rare occasion that I or my wife neglect to turn off um, a circuit before bed. I can't sleep and, and uh, or I will wake up, you know, very early uncharacteristically. Um, and so once, once we have at least taken some steps to reduce our exposure, it becomes much more obvious what those acute symptoms are. Um, for me, you know, it's, it's definitely been um, very obvious. I think for other people, it, it may not be as obvious because you may be talking about things like anxiety or depression or other kind of um, symptoms that would fall under the realm of, of mental illness, um, mental health challenges. And so if you go to, um, to a therapist to talk about how you know, you're thinking about all these things that are keeping you up at night and you're having trouble concentrating and all this, all this um, they may have a, a very easy label to, to attach to what's happening, um, but they will not know this likely cause of, of what's actually going on. Um, so for other people, you know, it can be things like skin rashes. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty common one. Um, certain types of fields, I will get joint pain, um, you know, old injuries will, will flare up. And so what I think is important to, to realize is that all of these EMFs in some way or another cause inflammation. And it's not always easy to parse out what is being caused by which exposure. But if you begin to look at um, the sort of basic idea that most disease is a result of inflammation, um, then you pretty quickly realize there, there's almost no health concern or symptom that can't be caused by EMFs. So we talk a lot about, you know, health being related to diet, exercise, you know, maybe even getting some sun exposure and your water quality for people that are more advanced. But sure. EMF is an element of health that overarches everything else and is arguably more important because it impedes our bodily function to such an extent that even if you have every single other thing in check in your life, you cannot handle a, a constant high EMF environment. I think that's true. I think that, um, you know, you, you see it time and time again with um, people on YouTube who seem relatively healthy and, and have, uh, you know, have underlying health problems. Um, I think that especially in our modern social media world in which we live, this issue has become so taboo for the simple reason that to bring it up, I think subconsciously at least, and, and maybe, um, maybe more consciously, uh, people realize that to talk about these issues is, is in a sense um, putting a label on oneself as weird. A quack, or, nuts, <laughs> crazy, tinfoil hat, all that type of stuff. Yeah, um, and taking it a step farther, if you were to begin telling all of your viewers, whatever you do, don't watch any of my videos on your phone or your tablet, that's not really going yeah. to uh, help, help, your, help you spread your message. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think that that's one of the things that's at play here um, is that few people are willing to go down that rabbit hole, so to speak, because we are afraid of opening that can of worms um, 
and potentially being ostracized mm -hmm. um, or at least <laughs> maybe losing a few subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there is certainly a psychological uh, factor, a number of psychological factors going on here um, in terms of our collective denial, uh, in terms of our psychological defense mechanisms that we all need in order to function. Um, if we take in every bit of stimulus and process it in a thorough way, we're not going to be able to get through the day. Um, and so ultimately we have to pick and choose what we're going to worry about, what we're going to focus on. And at the end of the day, EMFs are not a sexy thing to, uh, to bring up. Um, I'm often very hesitant when I meet people for the first time to, uh, to go into what it is I do, because usually I get sort of a deer in the headlights response. And at best, um, one of my coworkers um, more recently was, um, w was telling me, you know, that seems like a very difficult thing to concern yourself with. And I think that sums it up very nicely because mm -hmm. even the most thoughtful people, I think, tend to compartmentalize these issues as um, unnecessary mm -hmm. things that if we choose to, um, we, can, we can ignore. But it's, it's increasingly obvious that we can ignore them. Uh, we need to talk about them. We need to normalize them. And we need to um, basically accept that on some level, we're all, accept we're all affected by these exposures. The question is, what are your exposures? And what is your personal constitution? Are you immunocompromised from a um, condition that you were born with? Are you immunocompromised from contracting Lyme disease um, or some other, uh, some other pathogen? All of these things factor in and essentially these, um, these exposures are in many ways compounding other illnesses in our, in our lives. And, and it's also making it very hard to differentiate between um, some of these agents and exposures. It's difficult because people are so attached to their cell phones, uh, to their tablets, and a lot of things people spend the majority of their day, their day doing require being in a high EMF environment. But that doesn't mean that you know, reducing our exposure or trying to eliminate it when at home it isn't out of the realm of something that doesn't really affect your life too much. Uh, so before we go into the very specific types of you know, EMF concerns, mm -hmm. microwaves, I think would be a, a cool thing to just touch on and, and tell people how bad they are, how high the levels of radiation are, and, uh, and, and just kind of convey to people what your understanding of microwaves is uh, in the context of EMF. So microwave is, uh, is one form of radio frequency radiation. So to get a little bit technical, we're talking about frequencies between about um, 900 megahertz up to 30,000 megahertz, I believe. And, and what's like, uh, what's a, an ad, like a, a cell phone compared to that? Okay, so... Cell phones generally use frequencies in the 8, 9, uh, 1100 megahertz range up to 1900 megahertz. So those are all generally considered microwaves. Mm -hmm. um, and lower down, you have television, you know, maybe in the three or 400 megahertz. And then radio, FM radio, as you know, you turn your dial anywhere between 90 and 105 megahertz. But what is, what seems to be, um, you know, 
basically, if you look at uh, the way that a microwave oven works, it uses 2.45 gigahertz microwave radiation or radio frequencies. And it is known that, that certain frequencies have a, uh, a better or worse ability to penetrate water and to excite those water molecules. And so it just so happens that these frequencies, which were known to have the best ability to penetrate tissue and warm up that potato in your microwave, um, also are, are very effective at penetrating our, our bodies. Um, so we know the microwave is completely destroying the food and the nutrients in the food uh, in, in many capacities, 100%. That, that is something a lot of people understand, uh, but some people still don't. There is also an effect, though, the microwave emits radio frequency just by being there, let alone being on. But when you turn the microwave on, it gets spikes way high. It's a common misconception that that little metal box sitting on your counter contains the radiation within it. Um, and so if you can imagine, you know, it's, it's very common for children to learn how to operate a microwave at a very early age. And how much fun is it to stand next to it and watch your food go around in a circle and start to steam and, Oh, is it done yet? Um, what it, what, it turns out is actually happening is that a lot of that microwave, a lot of that energy is coming out, is being released. And as you know, from doing some testing in your house, when that microwave oven is running, you can detect the signal or the radiation 20, 30 feet away. I literally run out of the through, room when my parents turn the microwave on. It's through solid yeah. walls. And so that's, um, that's one reason that I don't use microwave anymore. Um, we, don't, we don't even own one. Um, and, and that was actually one of the clinchers for me early on uh, where I was living um, after I moved. There was a situation where uh, my neighbor would warm up his breakfast every morning at a certain time. And I was trying to figure out why I was waking up two hours before I needed to in a sudden jolt of, of energy that was, was really different than, than anything I had experienced. And what I began to notice was 30, 45 seconds after I would be jolted awake, I would hear the beeping of, of a microwave of the microwave downstairs um, as his breakfast was finishing. So when you have enough of these experiences, it becomes very obvious that there is a problem and that the vast majority of the public is, is simply not aware of the risks of these common appliances and electronics that we just take for granted as being miraculous convenient time savers. Mm -hmm. So before we go into the electronics, uh, you mentioned some categories earlier uh, that, that we can go into, but I'll list them first. So, you know, radio frequencies, which include the microwaves we just spoke about, there's dirty electricity, there's low frequency electric fields, low frequency magnetic fields, visible light, those things mostly pertain to EMF, and then there's two other things we also mentioned, which were air quality and grounding, which should definitely not be dismissed. And we'll touch on those later. Uh, but yeah. if we could just simply understand each of these things, I guess, starting with radio frequencies. Yeah. So radio frequencies are a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, again, you know, we're talking about radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, cellular, Wi-Fi microwave ovens, you know, even your key fob for your car, all of these things create radio frequencies. And depending on where that frequency is on the spectrum. Are we talking about routers and smart meters too? 
here? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Anything that is transmitting wirelessly is mm -hmm. going to have a yeah. radio for, frequency. For those of you that don't know, a smart meter is, you know, your utility electric meter outside. Uh, they used to have like the old ones that like turn dialed and then they had digital ones. But now these smart meters that they're installing that you might see like on the back of a Con Ed truck, like smart meters coming to your neighborhood, these emit very high levels of radio frequency. Absolutely. And so it wasn't that long ago, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that it was extremely uncommon to have uh, radio frequencies broadcasting within your home. You know, you would have a TV antenna or you'd have a radio and you'd be picking up radio frequencies that were bouncing around all over. Um, but what I often find visiting people's homes is that there are 15, 20, sometimes even 30 different transmitters generating radio frequency radiation inside our homes. And in addition to what might be coming from a cell tower or a smart meter, or even if you have opted out, your neighbor's smart meter. All of these things have exponentially increased our exposure to radio frequencies. Yeah, you can opt out of a smart meter and 30 feet away, your neighbor's house right there, there's a smart meter on his wall too. And where I live in Pennsylvania, uh, there's currently no opt out provision. Um, I worked very hard in, in Vermont to help uh, create one of the first, um, if not the first, no fee, um, no condition opt out. And I think five, six, seven percent of Vermonters have taken advantage of that and they can have their old analog meter free of charge indefinitely. Uh, but where I'm I live paying, now, I'm paying every month and I have to pay a hundred dollars up front. <laughs> you know, at least you have that option. I yeah. have 10 smart meters within 50 feet of my house. That's absolutely, that's absurd. And I don't like it one bit, but as of now, there's not really a good option that I have besides trying to limit my exposure to the things that I do have control over. Let's build a and titanium castle. <laughs> exactly. No, so I, I think that that's where it becomes very important to look at what's going on inside your house. That involves testing, either purchasing a meter yourself or um, hiring somebody to come in and investigate for you um, and looking at these other forms of, of radiation besides radio frequencies, uh, which you mentioned Dirty electricity is a lower... But, I'm sorry, before we jump into yeah, dirty no electricity, radio frequencies en encompass the majority of the primary concerns in our house, from our cell phone to our router, to our modem, to our, our, our you know, wireless phones, uh, to our cell phones, to microwaves, uh, to smart meters, utility meters. The majority of the concerns of, in our home are radio frequency from an EMF uh, like high output perspective? They are the most rapidly expanding exposure. These things, these like other, 5G, 5G is radio frequency for the most part. That's what we're getting blasted by the antennas and stuff. Exactly. So these are, um, these are EMFs that are going through space that, mm. um, that are traveling fast distances, you know, you can be four or five miles away from a cell tower. And if it's line of sight, you can detect that, that radiation. And, and in some cases it can be quite high depending on how it's oriented. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that it is, it is uh, the, the most common thing that I am um, called out to, to check our, our radio frequency sources, either from a cell tower or a smart meter, um, and and that's that's definitely an important thing to look at. What is equally important are the lower frequencies, including dirty electricity, um, and the low frequency power line fields, which we have been 
exposed to for much longer. Um, you know, essentially be, since the beginning of electrification, we've had these electric and magnetic fields in our homes and our workplaces. Um, any, anything that's, elect, that's electric will create these fields. Um, but as, uh, you know, as we both experienced, the radio frequencies tend to be the catalyst that begin people down the road of understanding these other sources, mm -hmm. um, which are, I think, possibly tolerable in, in most cases. Um, but when you stack them all up, when you add all of these things together, um, sometimes it's as simple as upgrading your phone or having a smart meter put on your home that is that straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm -hmm. It becomes too much of an overload of, of energy for our electrical bodies. So we touched on the radio frequency. Is there like, a, I, I mean, we can kind of safely say that radio frequencies are, yes, all of these are concerned, but radio frequencies might be at the top of the list. Is there like, is that list you gave me like dirty electricity, low frequency electric fields, low frequency magnetic fields and visible light, is that an approximate priority list or would you shift those around a little bit? It's really hard for me to, to prioritize because every situation is different. So you can be, you can have, um, you can have really high levels of one thing and that's the concern. I and see. So I so guess it really then, depends. It's a, it's a case by case basis. When I go and visit a home or an office, um, I come up with a very um, numeric analysis of, of what's going on. And I compare that to the level that are known to cause biological harm. Um, so it is a little bit hard to put them in order. Uh, I would say the priority is, is whatever um, you can, deal with uh it, it's whatever you can most effectively mitigate um, so this is something that you just mentioned that that is very important some of you guys might not have caught this was each of these forms of emf have a certain number that causes biological issues in people and matt has an understanding of what those levels are so when he goes into the home and he measures you know, your, your radio frequency, your dirty electricity, your low frequency electric fields, he can pretty much gauge each of those on a scale of one to 10, what, you know, how close you are to danger, if you're in danger, if it's really severe. Uh, right. So. so there are typical levels that I find, and then there are extreme levels that I find, and then there are levels that I would hope you can achieve. In some cases, the only practical option is to move. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has been increasingly the advice that I've been giving to more and more of my clients is that because of the cell tower near their home or the, um, you know, the power lines or, or substation nearby, that there's really no way to mitigate that. Um, but we know that, for example, dirty electricity is is very easy to um to measure right here i have two meters going um that are measuring dirty electricity and so quite briefly dirty i'm sorry those are plugged into the wall these outlet. are plugged in yep yeah. and what they're doing is coming up with a numerical uh uh analysis of the power quality or the noise that is present on the um on the power lines and so i can i'm sorry uh, sorry to interrupt you again on the number on the right your reading is 37 in my house that's about 350 just so you guys have a reference so my levels are 10 times his if i'm assuming that's bad <laughs> so for reference this is a, it's called a gram stetzer meter um you want to see levels below 30 below 50 is not too bad i find typical levels around 100 to 150. Um, over here, the, the range is a little bit different, but the same idea is, is you want to have, you know, levels below 50 or so. And then once you get up into the hundreds, you know, these both go up to uh, 2000. 
that's a red flag that there's, there's, uh, there's going to be some health consequences. Um, I can very easily plug in the charger for my computer right now and demonstrate how those numbers might jump a little bit. I don't know going if you up, can yeah. see that. Going up to 80. So yeah. that's just a, a very quick example yeah. of how um, things like laptop chargers, phone chargers, um, any, any device that is taking our, our alternating current, our AC power, and converting it to direct current or, or DC, rarely do so in a clean and tidy way. And so the result of that is called dirty electricity. So what is that? Is that actually like a, a, a signal of dirty electricity is coming out from the outlet just like a Wi-Fi signal is? It is a higher frequency that is being emitted from essentially any unshielded wiring in your home. And so I could plug in my laptop charger down here. What if, if the device is off or if it's just plugged in? Um, so it like can, if you plug in a lamp and it's plugged in, but it's turned off. Right. So energy efficient light bulbs are, are one huge culprit of dirty electricity. And if that light bulb's turned off, it's not going to affect the power quality or the dirty electricity. When you turn it on, you'll have a noticeable difference um, more often than not. And that's why I always recommend people use old fashioned incandescent or halogen lighting so that you can avoid these, um, these disruptions in power quality. Um, there are other, um, other causes like dimmer switches and, and certain appliances. But the main concern about dirty electricity is the lighting in your home. That is, uh, that's probably the main cause for most people are and specifically LED. Yeah. So there, there's a few things that you can do with dirty electricity. Um, they do make these filters that can do uh, an okay job of, of, uh, essentially filtering it. And it's really easy to compare that to water that you might be getting from a municipality through the tap. Now you'd hope it was just, it would just be water, but, of course, there's going to be all kinds of other contaminants. Antibiotics, hormones, herbicides, pesticides, heavy metals, it never ends. And yeah. so this, that's, that's the, the bottom line with dirty electricity. They are frequencies in between the low frequency and the high frequencies. They're called intermediate frequencies that should not be there, but they are. And if you can't filter those frequencies out, then really your only option is to avoid having as much electricity um, or voltage in your home. And so that kind of leads to the next set of sources, which are these low frequency power line. Um, you know, essentially 60 Hertz is what is used in North America. So I'm sorry, are the power lines low frequency electric fields or low frequency magnetic fields? They're both. They're both. Okay. When we're talking about power lines and house wiring, we're talking about both of those things. And when we're talking about magnetic fields, um, those, those, uh, those levels are measured in milligauss or nanotesla. And it's a pretty predictable range of, of uh, you know, most homes are somewhere in the 0.5 to 1 milligauss range. Once you start getting up over one and a half, two milligauss, that's where there's, there's a significant concern. Um, now, if that is caused by something within your own home, you know, either an appliance or a, a wiring error, um, I've had some clients with stray voltage basically coming in on their water pipes that would create magnetic fields upwards of 30 milligauss. Um, and, Co and those, copper pipe, the copper plumbing in my house has, has that. Well, not necessarily, but many 
Many homes do. If you no, I tested it. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's picking up. Uh, okay, it's what you tested with the the electric meter, right? The two okay. prongs. Okay. Is that it? Is that the same thing? Um, the multimeter. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's definitely one way to to test. Yeah, um, I, I tested uh, my copper pipes on a multimeter, and there was uh, electric. Yeah, there was a pretty. I think it was around that number, thirty to forty. So. So these low frequency fields are, are much more common, um, even if you have no wireless and even if you have all old fashioned light bulbs in mm -hmm. your home, but they still can be a problem. And especially if you are dealing with other stresses as we all are, this can be some of the easiest low hanging fruit to, to pick and to solve um, in terms of improving our health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that can be, um, as simple as not having cords plugged in around your bed, that can be, um, there are devices called dielectric couplings that can be attached to your water main that can, uh, that can essentially prevent those cur stray currents from coming into your home. So could this be like an air conditioner plugged into your bed, like next to your bed? That's something you want to avoid for sure. Um, essentially any unshielded wiring and that's most wiring in, in if, if it's on, if it's on, right. If, if the, if the device is turned on, even if the device is not turned on, oh. you still will have these electric fields, these alternating current um, electric fields from the voltage, um, that can be present. And so you can't see the wiring behind the wall, but in order to provide power to all the outlets, there's wiring. Um, and unless you know for sure, chances are that wiring is unshielded and creates an electric field three, four, maybe six feet out from it. And so taking things a little bit farther in terms of um, mitigation and precautionary approaches, I will actually turn off nearly all of the circuits in, in our house before going to bed. What that does is it drops the electric field close to zero. Cause the, um, the power isn't like if I have power lines outside my room, like right here coming in and down to the circuit breaker, that's, th that's what's emitting these fields that you're talking about essentially as well as the, uh, the wiring that's running all throughout your home. That's to going into any electrical outlet that's going to anything, okay. So you could have nothing plugged in and nothing powered on, but you will still have um, a very consistent electric field. And so there are two ways to measure that. One is with electric field meter. Um, I'll just grab that. So this is, this is one of the tools that I use that measures electric and magnetic low frequency fields. Um, and the other way is by testing body voltage. And so I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that you can do with, with that multimeter you have. Um, yeah, I was testing my body voltage and, you know, when I stood outside in like a, a normal environment, my body voltage would go down to zero if, I grounded myself using an outlet. My body voltage would go up to like 200. Uh, normally, my resting body voltage was probably 30 or 60 uh, in, in up, up here. I mean, what, is there, you have metrics for, for everything, right? So what, what we're really looking for are, is a body voltage of, of less than 0.1 volts per meter. Mm -hmm. Typically, in an electrified home, you're gonna have somewhere between one and two volts per meter. I've seen situations as high as seven volts per meter, but essentially that electrical pressure, that voltage. I think that, I was measuring millivolts. Okay, so the conversion is uh, 0.1 volts is the same as 100 millivolts. Okay. Um, and, and so what we're always looking for is the lower the, lower the better. Um, if you can get down to 0 0.05, 0 0.02, you know, then you're really, um, then you're really doing well. That would be 20 or or 50 
millivolts um, um, per meter. And so these, there are a number of ways that you can, that you can test, but that is probably the most effective way that I've found to improve my sleep and improve my mental state and, um, and also both of those things for, uh, for the rest of my family, I've, I've noticed really makes a huge difference. Now it's, it's simultaneously very easy to go down to your circuit breaker, um, wherever it is in the garage or your basement. Um, sometimes they're outside of homes and turn off circuits. Um, you know, and you don't even need to test your levels to test how you feel. If you do that for a few nights in a row and you find that you're sleeping better, well, you might be onto something. But for, uh, you know, $50, you can get a multimeter and test your body voltage. Uh, for a couple hundred dollars, you can get an electric field meter and have a, another sense of, of what's going on. Um, but whenever you can eliminate one source, you're going to, um, and this is, this is my understanding, you can um, improve your resiliency to these other sources. So if there are radio frequencies that you can't avoid for whatever reason, avoiding the electric fields and the dirty electricity is one way to sleep better, regulate your hormones, and essentially face the day with more energy and more ability to deal with those uh, unavoidable stressors. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clarify, uh, the cell phone towers do a, a bit of everything, the radio frequencies and the low frequencies? Cell phone towers... Um, there, there is some issue with dirty electricity. So if you live right next to a cell tower, that can affect your dirty electricity in the same way that the, the, uh, the effects on dirty electricity caused by, let's say, um, energy efficient lighting in your home can actually have a ripple effect and affect your neighbor's home if you're sharing the same transformer. So um, not as much, speaking to, this, to the cell towers, that's not so much an issue with the low frequency fields. Um, but certainly it's, it's, good to, it's good to understand that, uh, that the, whatever your neighbor is doing, and you know, in, in my case it was transmitting um, internet signals from, from his roof, can can actually have a much greater effect on on your health than than the things that you're doing. Um, so we categorize some examples. You know, for the radio frequencies, there's a lot of the the common concerns around the house. Uh, the dirty electricity was mostly the LED bulbs, uh, but are, are low frequency electric fields and low frequency magnetic fields? Uh, I mean, for the electric fields, we're talking about just general wiring in the house. Uh, what what falls into these categories of the electric fields and the magnetic fields at low frequencies? What like common devices that are that that are the primary concerns in people's homes? Okay, so magnetic fields tend to be generated the most by high power devices, um, you know, things like a like an electric range, or a hair dryer, or a space heater. Um, Anything that's drawing a lot of current is generally going to have a lot of, generally have a high magnetic field. So I shouldn't use a space heater? Well, just, you know, if you can give yourself three or four feet. Oh, so distance, it's a, okay, I see. Then it's usually not an issue. The, both the magnetic fields and the electric fields do dissipate fairly quickly with distance. Um, but again, you want to make sure that there is not an ambient field that is, is this why caught. electric blankets are very bad for you? Yes, electric blankets um, will create a magnetic field. There was some improvements made in the design of electric blankets in the 90s, which came from some, some research showing how bad they were. 
So they are not as bad now. Um, but if you're going to use an electric blanket, uh, the best thing you can do is use it as a way to warm up your bed before you get in. You never really want to have an electric blanket on your body um, unless you really need it. Uh, you know, you'd be much better off with a, uh, you know, with a couple of hot water bottles. That's something my, that's something my parents even knew, uh, you know, a heating pad being bad for you when you put it on yourself. So, so certainly we want to avoid having any electronics plugged in near our bed. Um, and if you can take that, as I said, a step farther, you can turn off the circuit to a bedroom. And then depending on the configuration of your house, you may want to turn off some additional circuits if there is lighting in the ceiling, floor, below your bedroom, things like that. Um, and, and that will, as I said, create an additional layer of, of safety or uh, create a natural, uh, a much more natural setting that is ideally going to create um, much better sleep and, mm -hmm. and allow your body to actually reach those, that stage three and stage four sleep, which is so hard to, to come by nowadays. Um, you know, it's so common. Sleep disorders are, are just rampant. Um, and I know that that's been one of the challenges you've had, um, but I think that looking at all of these sources as a whole um, can really help parse out what is causing what. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to try one thing for a few days, reintroduce the exposure, and then it's going to be much more obvious. But if we just sort of throw our hands up and say, well, there's nothing I can really do about it, then, um, you know, we're not going to find out. Then we'll end up being in a, in a EMF hole, hell hole with a 5G blasting us and uh, smart meters blasting us from every which way. And then people really, that's where things will really go downhill even, even further. Uh, so uh, there's another thing, the visible light. Visible light that's the is, LED, right? That's what we were talking about, the LED? Or? So light is, is just another form of electromagnetic radiation, mm -hmm. or EMF. Um, it's a different frequency that obviously we can see, um, but it has just as much of an effect. You know, there's some much more mainstream research on the effects of blue light on melatonin production. And so um, you're probably familiar with the application Flux, which is... Yeah, I, I have it out right now. And uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is something that a lot of people really know about, you know, reducing the blue light exposure at night. But keep in mind, you, all of you guys doing this blue light exposure stuff at night, using Flux, using like, like orange glasses, stuff like this, that is a pretty small element compared to the rest of this EMF stuff. So if you guys, you know, are going to go out of your way to, to do the, the reduction of the blue light, I would argue that reduction of EMF from these other frequencies is far more important. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, there's some pretty well understood ways that you can, you can protect yourself from, uh, from these harsher, more daylight type uh, frequencies of, of visible light. Um, I'm finding more and more that cars have these awful LED um, lights, either tail lights or sometimes even the headlights are LED. And I'm finding all the time now that I have to basically move my meter, move my mirrors while I'm driving so that I'm not getting that reflection in my eyes while I'm driving or have a pair of, of those orange amber glasses on hand um, to filter out some of that. Um, but what, what we're basically talking about is, is, uh, is a very unnatural form of light that can come from fluorescent lighting, LED lighting um, that has a an unnatural or spiky uh, 
power spectrum distribution. And, and what that means is um, the, the light that is emitted by the sun um, has a wide range of, of frequencies, you know, in the same way that whole foods have a wide range of nutrients. Um, and then these newer energy efficient lighting options have very specific frequencies that, you know, are akin to eating just, let's say, sugar um, or, or something. It, this, gets, this gets very complicated. So yeah. the, the main concern, of, so visible light is, it's not, act, is it actually emitting a signal or it's just altering how our body's, you know, metabolism is functioning? Yeah, there are a few different mechanisms. Um, obviously, we're taking in light through our eyes, and that is communicating with our brains and our pineal glands, and essentially telling us what time of day it is. But it's different than the other frequencies in a sense that it's not directly blasting something at you. Well, it's different in that it's not affecting our organs. It's yeah. not penetrating our, our bodies in the same way. Well, um, basically what I'm saying is, let's say you covered your face with a blindfold and a mask and you couldn't see the light, you wouldn't be affected by it, right? That's, that's probably true, yeah. Okay, okay, that um, makes sense. Yeah, and the chief, the chief concerns are, you know, just like we broke down chief concerns and the other things, it's, it's, the L, it's primarily LED lighting and very bright LED lighting, right? LED seems to be the worst, the worst mm -hmm. from a um, light emitting perspective but both LEDs and fluorescent bulbs, you know, also known as CFL bulbs, have uh, a measurable effect on this dirty electricity, this power quality. So your neighbor could turn on a light in their home and that can affect the dirty electricity in your home, even if you have everything off. So that's where it really just becomes important to measure what is going on. Um, it's really impossible to guess what our exposures are. Uh, we can know pretty well, okay, we're going to be trying to go to bed soon. It's probably not, not a good idea to spend a lot of time with, with a phone right up to our face. Um, or, you know, if we're, if we're having trouble um, sleeping, trying to avoid having too much screen time before bed. These kinds of things help. Um, but I think that, you know, as often happens in the mainstream, only the tip of the iceberg is, is noticeable. So in this case, the visible light we sort of all know by now um, is not good to have before bed. But all of these uh, hidden frequencies that we can't see and that are harder to, um, to measure end up being the much more serious problem. Mm -hmm. So we've touched on like the, the lighting, the electrical concerns. I, I would guess the visible, I mean, I, I mean, I guess you would agree too that like the visible light is kind of categorized differently than the radio frequencies, the dirty electricity, the low frequency electric fields and the low frequency magnetic fields, although it, it still is EMF itself. Um, so I think I, the I'd, takeaway with visible light is that you want to be, as, as you are, are um, you know, accurate in pointing out, you want to be maximizing your sun exposure um, and, and making sure that you, you're getting uh, nice healthy doses of, of radiation to which we evolved. And, and then using lights like incandescent bulbs or halogen bulbs that are much Similar, much more similar to the sun in terms of the spectrum compared to these modern energy efficient sources like LEDs and fluorescent bulbs. Mm -hmm. So there's also two other concerns outside of all of this EMF stuff that are air quality as well as grounding. Uh, the brief summary before you jump in is that you know, if you leave your window closed and you're breathing in your room, the CO2 levels go up drastically, and that can be a concern. And pertaining to grounding, 
the Earth stores electrons. And electrons are basically like antioxidants to our body. And when your feet are not in direct contact with the Earth, whether you're you know, in an apartment building or you're wearing rubber-soled shoes, your body's not getting those, those free electrons, those antioxidant properties. You're, the Earth is not telling your body essentially where it is. Yeah, I think that these two, two issues are, um, are important. We'll try to cover them quickly, but um, um, you know, a few, couple years after beginning to understand EMFs, I came across this phenomenon of grounding. And there is uh, a documentary, I think you can just watch it on YouTube, called Grounded. Um, and you know, I've communicated a little bit with, with the filmmaker um, about that. Um, I've actually um, s- sort of had, had some issues with, with grounding and I've pointed them out. Um, um, you know, I think that, that grounding is, is really best if you are outside uh, with your bare feet on the ground. You know, if you can go to a beach, if you can go swimming in a natural body of water, um, you know, you don't even have to swim, just soak your feet in the water. Um, and that's going to be a great way to reap the benefits of the earth's natural electromagnetic field. At the same time, you can discharge some of that, um, some of that built up energy that you're getting from working in an office, uh, or living in an electrified home, um, where I do caution people is is uh, you know the, the sort of um, commercial commercially available approach to grounding is is to buy a, a grounding mat or a, uh, a wristband that plugs into the third prong of of any outlet any grounded outlet that can be um, one way for for people to try grounding my experience is that it is probably the most useful if you are really trying to uh, bounce back from from uh, a serious health issue. I don't see it as a long term sustainable way to connect with with the earth. Um, you know, I think I might put it in the same category as um, tanning in a tanning bed. You know, is it's not going to kill you to do occasionally, and I think it's something I'd recommend everybody try. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to, uh, to buy a plug from a hardware store. Well, connect it to a two, wire. There, what are the, the, the concerns there are tanning beds do emit high levels of EMF, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I usually go to a tanning bed every day. So, uh, at least a couple times a week. So I know I'm getting blasted, but sometimes I have to, uh, have you tested the levels in a tanning bed? Are they, are they very high? I haven't, honestly. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to when I'm. I'm gonna buy some meters uh, after this, and and I will definitely test the tanning bed for everyone and for everyone else because I don't think anyone's ever done that actually. Uh, but the concern with the grounding is the dirty electricity in the wall, right? So every indoor environment is is going to be different, and yeah. so I've found. Um, you know, pretty, pretty obvious improvements grounding in certain buildings and other places I'll go and I'll plug in and I'll instantly feel unsettled or I'll get ringing in my ears. And then there, you know, there's always the concern that you don't know what's how your home is wired. Mm -hmm. Um, There could be a wiring error that could, that could be essentially increasing your exposure EMFs. And, um, you know, my understanding is that when you are, you are grounded, you are, um, essentially, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to act as a conduit for certain EMFs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you really want to be careful about where you are grounding. Uh, I think it's a useful tool. Again, there's no harm in trying it. But if you're not feeling well after doing it, if you're not just, you know, if you're not feeling um, 
the benefits, that may be an issue with the EMF environment. So certainly you want to always begin by eliminating the sources of EMF in your environment first. And if you've done all of those things, then I would recommend grounding mm -hmm. um, as kind of a, a final step. And I think as, a, as another thing that you mentioned, you know, air quality is, is another overlooked issue. Um, you know, there are obviously all kinds of um, filter, air filters and um, products that we can purchase to take the particulate out of our air. Um, but I think that just as important are the gases in our air and um, you know co2 is one of these gases that we all produce it's a waste it's a byproduct of of breathing and as uh you know most people know the atmosphere has co2 levels of somewhere around 400 parts per million it's not uncommon uh, to find levels upwards of 2,000, 3,000 in, um, in a home, in a bedroom that's all closed up. So this is a, uh, this is a meter um, that quite simply shows the levels of CO2. And you can see that they are about 460 parts per million. Um, so for reference, you want to have levels below 800 in your home. Um, if you can simply have a window cracked most of the time, depending on your climate, that's mm -hmm. one way to reduce the CO2. So most people, it's a matter of opening a window, but if you were in like a New York City, would that maybe, is there not enough plant life in New York City to achieve a CO2 level that low? Is that possible? I think that the ambient CO2 levels in a city are going to be higher, um, but they will, they will certainly be lower if you can bring in some of that outside air, mm -hmm. either through a mechanical air exchanger. Um, so that's one option is for a few hundred dollars, you can have a machine that is, has two vents, one going out and one coming in. What and if you just like open the window and put a fan outside and blow the air inside your house? <laughs> that does an amazing job too. You know, I think it's always a balancing act between keeping the things we want out, left out, you know, whether it's air pollution, smells, um, you know, where I live, I'm, I'm constantly battling the secondhand smoke smells that are coming in from nearby. Um, and so it's tricky, but when you can spend $60, $70 on a little device like this, you don't have to guess, you know, you don't have to leave your window wide open 24 uh, seven. It might just be that you want to leave your bedroom window cracked while you're sleeping uh, so that you can keep those levels in check. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that people are really unaware of that they're not concerned about uh, at this moment, at least in, until they really understand it themselves and look into it themselves. One thing I thought might've been interesting was driving a car. So when you're driving a car, you're in this metal box that's full of CO2 because of all the gas on the road. There's a lot of brake fumes. You know, most people have their cell phone on in their car. Uh, some people have the radio on in their car. Uh, some people are driving by highways that typically have cell phone towers. I think uh, this is something that you know, drive, people that drive in their car for long periods of time every day might experience chronic health issues because of this, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do travel a lot for work. Um, you know, sometimes I'm in the car for four or five hours straight. And, and so I definitely notice that, um, you know, after a couple hours, it tends to affect the way I feel. How much of that you can attribute to just simply sitting, um, versus the exposures from cell towers, mm -hmm. the car's engine itself. Um, those things, you know, again, you can quantify if you choose. Um, it's, there are a number of meters that you can leave on and just leave, you know, on the seat next to you. 
And you might know that uh, taking that route to work, you're going to get blasted versus That's interesting. I'm never, a slight yeah. detour um, going the other way. You can significantly reduce your exposure. So, you know, driving is uh, you're going to be exposed. The best mm. thing you can do, obviously, is not have any sort of transmitter like, mm. um, you know, Bluetooth. You want to turn that off. There are obviously most cars now come with Bluetooth enabled and that's gonna be enabled by default. You wanna, using a meter to test, you want to go into the settings and learn how to, to turn that off. I've had rental cars that every time you turn the car on, the Bluetooth would come back on and mm -hmm. I'd have to go in and do a whole bunch of, of uh, button pushing just to have that signal turned off every time I drove it. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to, to realize that cars have these low frequency fields as well. And so if you have a Gauss meter uh, to measure the magnetic fields, you want to make sure that those levels in the seat, in the driver's seat, are below 5 milligauss. Um, now, 5 milligauss is still pretty high, but it's increasingly difficult to find a car less than that. And I've driven and tested cars, you know, upwards of 20 or 25 milligauss. So there's always a range if you're buying and buying a car test a few different things. If you're going to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a new car, it's, uh, it's not unreasonable to suggest that you spend a couple hundred dollars on meters to make sure mm -hmm. that that investment that you're going to be living with for the next five, 10, 15 years is going to be mm -hmm. at the very least, not the worst case scenario. So the actual, you know, going into, we can go a little bit into, you know, what steps can we take to reduce exposure? But if you guys are curious about like meters, protective devices, very specific things, all of this stuff is, is way too complicated to explain on, you know, a podcast. So what I'm going to do is, you know, gather that information and I will do a separate video explaining, you know, this is the meter you get to do this and I'll show, I'll show you guys how I use it. Uh, but in general, you know, for, most of the household devices we know, you know, get away from the microwave, ideally remove a microwave from your home. Same with certain, uh, you say, you're saying certain phones that are, you know, it's your house landline, but it's wireless. It has a decked uh, thing that's built into it that emits a, a signal. So for your landline phone in your house, you want it to be wired, ideally, and you can get very long wires. Uh, for your cell phone, Ideally, keep your cell phone on airplane mode throughout the day. And, you know, if you do turn your cell phone on, try to use it on speakerphone uh, and, and just try to mainly minimize your cell phone use throughout the day. If you can, you know, keep, if you need to keep your cell phone on for a phone call, keep it, you know, at least 10, 15 feet away from you, ideally. And I'll also add in the, probably the best piece of technology that you can add to your cell phone to make it safer is what's called an air tube headset and so rather than having the um, the wire or the speakers right in your ears um, the speaker is farther down away from your head and then the sound travels by air through a tube sort of like a stethoscope um, and that is um, you know 30 40 dollar item that that you can pick up um, that's going to vastly reduce your, your exposure, not just to the radio frequencies, but also the, the low frequencies. Uh, yeah, that was called a, that's called an air tube headset. That's about $30 on Amazon uh, that you can plug into your phone and use it for, uh, you know, for just for all phone calls in general. Uh, that's yeah, if you have a cell phone, I, I think you really want to have, have that. You know, personally, I don't own a cell phone um, with the exception of a, a phone that that doesn't have a uh, so so this is my cell phone um, stays in the car and it doesn't actually have a, a calling plan so I can't use this with one exception and that's calling nine one one so that's kind of a, a neat hack that um, you know when people say oh well you need a cell phone in case of emergencies you can have a cell phone in case of emergencies and not be tempted to use it. Uh, once a year, 
I will use this to uh, call 911 and test to make sure that it's still working. I you know, they say, what's your emergency? And I say, this isn't an emergency. I am just confirming that this old cell phone that I paid $20 for can still call you in an emergency. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's something that we have collectively sort of just become um, complacent about, you know, we give our children cell phones in order to, in case there's an emergency, but then those cell phones become toys, they become video game devices, and they become, um, you know, maybe other tools for uh, less productive uses, let's mm -hmm. say. And, um, and so I think that, you know, if you have a smartphone, um, it's probably not realistic that you're going to throw it in the garbage. Um, but there are ways that you can limit your, uh, limit your exposure. And I think, you know, the main one is that if you're not expecting a call, um, leave it in airplane mode. You know, the world, the, the world is, uh, there's, there's a lot to see in the world. And, um, and I think a lot of people are missing out on, on things by constantly being distracted by their phones. Um, so, you know, I think maybe that's, that's going to be um, an extreme step for most people, but I will tell you straight up, you know, I really appreciate having, you know, when I'm talking on the phone, um, I'm, I'm basically at home. Um, you know, there's a rare exception that I'll hop on Wi-Fi while I'm traveling, but essentially having that, um, having that focus of accessing the internet and communicating from a fixed place is something that we've all kind of lost, lost sight of. And, um, and it doesn't have to be a huge insignificant, um, inconvenience or sacrifice. That cell phone that you have, that's you, if that cell phone is turned on, even if it doesn't have a service, it still emits some signal, right? Yeah, it's going to be checking. It's going to be uh, emitting RF. Um, if, if it's turned on, it's going to, but for the most part, um, you know, it, it's never really turned on. Okay. So we've covered a lot of things. And, and yes, there are a lot of concerns, guys, about just things in your environment. But, you know, we went over a few ways to reduce it. Uh, I know we mentioned that, you know, smart meters and these utility meters you can opt out, you know, cell phone towers and a lot of things, unfortunately, you know, you don't know what your neighbor's doing. You can't move away from these things. Uh, I, I think a solution for everyone is, uh, you know, really investing in, in these meters that I will discuss in, in hopefully in a video within the next few weeks and just being able to understand, okay, am I having issues? What can I do to address them? And, and what improvements can I make? But, you know, as we said, Matt, you know, turns the power off to his house. Uh, you know, I'm sure most people can turn off a few breakers every day. Uh, you know, even a simple recommendation as, you know, turning your cell phone off at night and keeping your phone on airplane mode throughout the day is a huge step in the right direction for most people. Uh, you know, making sure to turn your routers off at night, you know, not standing next to the microwave. There's quite a few things that people are doing that you would consider very extreme and very, you know, reckless in a way in this context that people can remove. So, uh, just being aware of these small things, I think is a big step in the right direction. And then as people feel better and realize how quickly things are improving, then they can figure out what the other concerns are. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that, uh, what it boils down to is, is you need to quantify what's going on. It's, it's impossible to guess what your exposure is. And until you quantify it, remove it and reintroduce it, you're not really going to know how it's affecting your health. Uh, Matt, this, this was great. I think there's so much valuable information in here that, you know, it kind of has been scattered all around and, and it's probably taken you thousands and thousands of hours to figure out yourself. Uh, you, I you still do feel like I'm scratching the surface. And I think that, you know, if I can, if I can leave people with, with one bit of advice it is to not be afraid to be curious um, not be afraid to be skeptical and to realize that 
yes, this is a very long uh, rabbit hole of information that we can choose to go down or we can choose to avoid, um, but we don't need to be experts. All we need to do is be curious and understand that um, just because maybe we've made some mistakes in the past doesn't mean that we can't fix them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So you do have your own YouTube channel. It's called EMF Minimalist. Uh, Matt, Matt is always on my live streams posting stuff. Uh, you can go to his YouTube channel, which I will link at the end here, EMF Minimalist. Uh, but guys, guys, if you have questions, please uh, you know, divert them to me. If you'd like to contact Matt for anything, uh, it, it would be like a professional EMF consultation. Uh, you know, he, he's very busy. Uh, if, if you do have just questions about basic things, where to get started, uh, definitely direct those to me. And, and if there's anything that um, you know, I don't understand or you know, someone that it is interested in speaking to uh, Matt, I, I can put you guys in touch. I just don't want uh, Matt being bombarded with uh, you Thanks. know, so many emails and stuff. But he does, the reason I'm bringing up his YouTube channel is because you know, he does have videos on his YouTube channel where he does explain a lot of the stuff and go over things. And, and there are also other YouTube channels on YouTube, uh, of course, that can, there are people just demonstrating various things like this. Uh, and, and you could find someone measuring, if you typed it in, you could find people measuring radio frequencies, dirty electricity, electric fields, low frequency magnetic fields. You know, the quality of the videos isn't that good and these people aren't usually showing the meter. So it can be a little difficult, but I uh, hope, as I said, in the future, uh, we will uh, you know, I'll have some meters for you guys. I'll show things. I'll explain them. And uh, I guess we can kind of figure out this journey together. Uh, Matt, I can't thank you enough for this. And I didn't thank mention. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, but Matt, Matt was so kind uh, and I couldn't believe this. You know, he sent me uh, a bunch of meters that he let me use temporarily to test my environment. And, and that really helped put me a step in the right direction. Uh, and I, I really can't thank him enough for that and the amount of information that he's helped him with for free. Uh, so hopefully I can repay that in some way. Uh, but Matt, did you have, uh, I mean, I know you just had a final message there. Did you have uh, anything else you wanted to convey to people? Um, you know, you know, kind of maybe what you're looking to do in the future. And uh, if people did want to reach out to you for like an EMF service, what would that entail? Yeah, so I live in Pennsylvania. And, um, and so generally I can reach most of the East Coast uh, in person. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely interested in helping people however I can. And I think one of those ways is, uh, is over email, um, over the phone, um, through YouTube, you know, I think it's, it's such an amazing way to share one's personal experience and understanding of the world with, you know, basically a, a, a limitless audience. Um, you know, I've been I've been on on YouTube for um, you know maybe eight, eight years or so, um, and you know I only have two thousand subscribers, but um, but I still get a lot of positive feedback, and and that encourages me, you know, as I'm sure it encourages you, uh, to just keep working on this, uh, to keep keep sharing um, my story, and hopefully normalize these wonky, complicated issues um, that quite frankly can be scary. Um, but I think that that is easily uh, surmountable if we kind of, um, you know, gentle with ourselves and, and accept that we're not going to learn everything overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, we may, it may take some time. It's taken me nine years to get to a point where, um, where I feel pretty comfortable with, with my knowledge, but I'm learning new things every day. And, and so I think the main thing that I would emphasize is to stay curious and, and don't be afraid to um, invest a little bit of money in some devices that will help quantify your environment and that you can share with other people. You know, I'll just mention that one of those meters that, that I loaned you over the winter is now on loan to 
my son's school and uh, one of the classes in his school is going to be using that um, to understand a little bit more about their environment and hopefully shed some light on, um, you know, what can be a complicated set of issues. Yeah, people will spend, well, there's a new iPhone coming out every, what, six months and people are spending $1,200 on it. You could buy every single meter you would ever need for that amount of money uh, to Absolutely. test any, any sort of radio uh, EMF field in your house, any, anything. Very, very tiny investment for, for what this is worth. It's, it's easy to make excuses, but it's a lot easier to be informed, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Matt, again, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I think this will hopefully be an invaluable resource of information uh, for people that are looking into this and that, you know, the next, you know, few videos that I do related to EMF, you know, whether it's about New York City, whether it's about, you know, airplanes, uh, whatever it may be, you know, showing people the meters. Uh, I think this is, you know, a, something that hasn't really been, you know, stone that hasn't been unturned yet, so to speak. Uh, and, and who knows if, you know, five, 10 years from now, if uh, this is something that will happen or won't happen. Uh, but uh, this has been Perfected Health Podcast, Episode 6 with Matthew Fiskin, learning more than I could ever imagine about EMF. So let's uh, say goodbye to everyone. Thank you guys Appreciate for joining it, us. <laughs> See you next time.